The first architect of Santa Cruz County was nature herself. From the magnificent mountains to the forests to the coastline to the valleys, nature was bountiful in her uh, beauty. We often call the forests the cathedral groves because they remind us of uh, cathedrals made by man. Even the Roman arches compare with the natural bridges of Santa Cruz. And the first inhabitants that we know of are the Alones. And uh, they lived gently on the land. They were mostly naked, <coughs> lived uh, off the land in a way that um, uh, left little imprint. Here we see some of their, uh, their villages. The one at the river mouth in Santa Cruz was known as Aulinta, which means the place of red abalone. And Ohlone itself used to be another word for abalone. It's where we get the term abalone. We can see that the types of dwellings that they lived in were like beehives or, uh, or maybe thatched uh, igloos. And you can see here the framework of one that's just being thatched. They were also great basket makers. And when the Spanish got here, they found this perplexing that a group of Indians living in the proximity of so much, uh, so many verdant forests were not using the timber as part of their uh, lifestyle. It seemed to be all grass and reeds and so forth. And so they thought these were the most destitute of Indians, when in fact, just the opposite was true. Being a lone, was a name that may, other tribes may have called them because they were the abalone people. They were the people who collected the abalones that were then dispersed throughout the uh, state of California. They used abalone in various ways. They could become glittery fish hooks or uh, uh, jewelry or carved into small disks and strung up as wampum which was used as a form of trade. So in one respect, Santa Cruz was the Fort Knox of the Indian communities. They did receive um, visitors from as far away as the High Sierras. These are some of the Ohlone dance dresses because when they had people over, especially uh, uh, traders from outside the area, they liked to entertain them. So dancing, and playing games and gambling, all the things that you uh, experience even today at the Santa Cruz boardwalk were done by the former people in about the same place. And even their reed canoes were uh, almost identical to those that were used by the Egyptians at the height of the Egyptian empire. So these were not primitive people in the sense that they had little technology. In fact, we found awls in uh, archaeological digs that show that their ability to <coughs> carve holes in these tiny little wampum beads uh, is the high technology of their day. Now, the Spanish arrived, and they brought with them their own culture and their own expectations. The first thing they saw was not the people as they came into the Santa Cruz County area. They crossed the Pajaro River and found uh, an effigy like this, which was a, a bird effigy, and after it they called the valley the Pajaro Valley. And as they wandered in this wasteland, they calculated the first time that they saw this area, uh, they came into a village of about 500 inhabitants in Watsonville. That was one of the largest uh, single uh, villages that they knew of. Most of the villages up and down the coast were of maybe uh, 20 to 40 inhabitants. So they were far more extended families than anything else. And this was the first place that the Spanish discovered the uh, redwoods, which they called the Palo Colorado. So when the Spanish built their buildings, it was not adobe that they built. They built 
split log palisadal cabins and thatch them over a, uh, as a roof. And this is somewhat what the first uh, Santa Cruz mission would have looked like with the bells hung on uh, tripods outside of the uh, uh, main structure instead of a tower. Unfortunately, four months after they had completed the Santa Cruz mission by the riverside uh, in Santa Cruz, about where uh, the lumber company is today, uh, there was a big storm and it washed the uh, building away. And so they moved it further back from the river and more flooding and storm and uh, they lost it the following year as well. So finally they moved up on top of Mission Hill and built their first adobe structure and never again did they build on the flatlands. Uh, from that time on the area where the downtown is was known as the uh, Hortaliza or Mission Vegetable Garden. To the north was the Mission Orchard. In the Harvey West area was the uh, Mission Vineyard. In the, uh, well actually, yeah, and uh, where, about where Costco is, the uh, Potrero, that was where they raised their horses. Now they didn't have a tower on the original Santa Cruz mission, but the interesting thing is the Indians were not unfamiliar with adobe. They already used uh, mud in, their, uh, in creating their sweat lodges. And the sweat lodge was as much a, uh, a men's club as it was a, uh, a sacred place because this was where they performed their purification ceremonies before they went out hunting and doing other activities. So this is the evolution of the Santa Cruz mission starting of course with a palisadal structure and then when it was built on Mission Hill it was originally constructed with a flat roof. This is because they came from a desert region that had little rainfall. However in 1795 water pooled on the roof and caused the roof's collapse and so they had to build a pitched roof on top of it after that and the weight of that pitched roof required buttressing the original uh, facade. Now when other settlers arrived, the first settlers from uh, Mexico came up the coast to establish the settlement of Villa de Branciforte in 1797. Unfortunately when they arrived they were ill-equipped to do anything having just uh, survived uh, one of the Manila Galleon journeys across the ocean and back again um, and so when they arrived though nothing was prepared for them there were no buildings ready there were no tools available and so they stayed at the mission until finally the mission who didn't want them there in the first place uh, decided to uh, send some mission guards over to build them two dormitories one for men and one for women this was on the north end of the uh, Branciforte Avenue and the avenue itself was laid out as their main street. Eventually, by 1802, they built their first adobe structure and they did it with uh, the labor of the Mission Indians who were always rented out for such occasions. And we see uh, the process uh, occurring here. And this was the Comisionados adobe. We're not quite certain if uh, as Edna Kimbrough once said, that this might be the uh, adobe that she lived on Goss Street. But um, if that is true, then that adobe would be the oldest one on the uh, Monterey Bay. This was more typically what was uh, found in Branciforte, and they weren't building their structures along the, uh, uh, the road. They were hiding them more towards the end of the cliff so that they would be out of the prying eyes of the, uh, the guards and others because uh, Brans uh, yeah, Branciforte was a very uh, controlled settlement. And uh, in fact, they felt that they had so little, um, so little representation that when the funds for constructing Branciforte were pulled in 1802, they finally decided to hold the first election in California in order to elect their own uh, uh, alcalde 
and board members, um, council members, and a sheriff. So Santa Cruz became the birthplace of democracy in Spanish California. And here we see them raising long-horned cattle. And you can see that they're rather uh, thin beasts. They weren't the beef cattle that we're used to. These were raised for the toughness of their hides, and they were sold for the hide. And the hide was called a California dollar because it fetched two dollars from uh, trading ships on the ocean. But the uh, large <coughs> herds, which continued to multiply along the coast here, became tasty treat for the bears, and so we had a bear population explosion. As uh, a result, this was practically an entirely uh, horseback society. You seldom saw a Brancifortian walk. Anywhere they went, they had to be on their horseback in order to be above the, uh, uh, the horns of the cattle or whatever predators might be out there. But Branciforte Avenue, as the settlers enjoyed it, uh, became a famous uh, racetrack. And they enjoyed various uh, sports along there, since they were bred to the saddle, so to speak. Well, eventually, um, the Indians along the coast started revolting and burning down some of the missions by setting aflame the, uh, the thatched roof. and so. They had to replace the roofing with uh, tile work. And now we see how the uh, Santa Cruz mission eventually looked. We'll close in on it. You can see here a lot of the uh, workshops where they produced tiles and looms, uh, where they produced the uh, clothing that they wore. And uh, well, I just can't see it, so you'll have to read it yourself. And then on the other side of the compound, we have the East Quadrangle, and this was the residential part. Now, uh, the, so the uh, lower uh, two-story building at the end of the long row was where the uh, women and single girls would stay. And the uh, long wing there is part of what still remains, and that was the residential wards. And then to the other side, we see the uh, bachelor ward. And at the far end, near Adobe Street, was the pest uh, house where people who were ill stayed. And then the, uh, uh, the granary uh, is on the other side of the field. So eventually, they did get uh, bells. And ironically, some of the bells said, made in Boston. And that was because uh, the person who gave them the bells gave them as, a, uh, um, as an exchange so that they would grant permission for his marriage. And he was an American. So they hung their bells in two towers. And we really don't know what the towers look like, but uh, this represents uh, the fact that they had the two towers. There were two tolling bells, and then the rest were stationary chime bells. Finally, one of the towers collapsed, and so they put all of the, all of the uh, bells in the uh, other tower and built an additional cupola on top. And the weight of this eventually collapsed that one as well. <laughs> and this is what the interior of the uh, sanctuary eventually looked like. You can see the ornamented beams. And the, the thing shows that, that we still have a flat roof inside the uh, the pitched roof, the original flat roof, was rebuilt and put back in place. And they said that they even had a, uh, a mural ceiling that was similar to the one in Santa Clara. Also, when they needed marble, they simulated it. They were very resourceful for the frontier. When they needed a balustrade, they would paint it on the wall until they actually got around to, uh, to building one. <laughs> I've even seen in some of the missions pictures of a little table set off to the side, which you can imagine at one time was the blueprint for what they wanted to have eventually in that spot. 
And they also uh, painted their instructions to the Indians. This is the music room uh, at Carmel, but it shows how they would teach them uh, through diagrams on the walls. Now in this picture, something might seem out of place. You can see, uh, well, some of those chairs are actually uh, Chinese. And that might not look right because our picture of what uh, mission life was like uh, does, not, um, does not admit multiculturalism. I mean, there was cultural overtones and overlap. And uh, they were, after all, they had the Manila galleons and were trading with, the, uh, with Asia. In fact, they also traded with American sailing ships, which were like uh, shopping malls of, of the high seas. They would stop, and you could go down into the hold and look over their merchandise. So they might have had stuff from New England as well. And they even uh, took some of their aesthetic clues from Spain and the uh, leftover remains of the Muslim culture there. Here we see at the Alhambra, uh, lotus patterned fountains, and here we see at Mission Carmel the lotus patterned fountains duplicated in Spanish style. The Indians were the ones who ornamented the missions according to the instructions of the padre or of the uh, uh, overseer, and yet when they were given the opportunity, they fell back on their own pattern work. And we can see some of that in the frieze work that is above the bench here, an Indian motif. The mission mill is not the kind of mill that we uh, are familiar with because it had a, uh, a horizontal wheel instead of vertical. But this was uh, originally built in 1812 at the site that is now the Babbling Brook um, Inn. And then it was later turned into another, uh, uh, turned into a tannery with an upright mill, mill wheel. Well, eventually the uh, mission was closed down in 1833 or 34. And the mission had been one of the chief suppliers of lumber to the Southern California missions because no sanctuary could be built that was any wider than the widest beams that they could use for, the, uh, uh, for roofing the sanctuary. And so Santa Cruz became one of the chief suppliers of the longest uh, roofing beams. Well, a lot of Scotsmen uh, came into the Santa Cruz Mountains, like Isaac Graham and another of a, a number of others. And he established in 1842 the first power sawmill in California a sawmill run by a water wheel. In the meantime, the ranch adobes started to proliferate, and they were far more elaborate than the early examples were. Here we see the Castro adobe in Watsonville. They tend, uh, would sometimes have a second floor fandango hall or ballroom, and then have all their living floor, uh, living on the first floor. And this is how the Santa Cruz mission looked in its uh, later days. And we see that the tower, unlike the replica, is actually semi-detached. And the, uh, the parapet is uh, a raised parapet. And the colonnade shows uh, that it's made out of um, possibly adobe rather than, uh, uh, rather than wood. Elihu Anthony was one of the first Americans to arrive in, uh, in Santa Cruz and settle here permanently in 1848. When he arrived, all, uh, he was directed to the uh, ruins of the uh, Santa Cruz mission area because this was land that was not owned by uh, some of the, uh, the Spanish settlers. And the Spanish kind of wanted to uh, to keep the American population away from them because uh, the Americans tended to be a little more wild living. And in fact, the building in the middle there, the two-story building, that was the uh, monogamy ward in the old mission. 
and it was later used as the Huskau or the jail. But when uh, that failed, it became the courthouse. So Elihu Anthony established the first uh, building uh, or for the first business on the uh, flats about where the clock tower is today. And it was the, the first foundry outside of San Francisco <coughs> in California. And it included a general store and he was also the first postmaster. And then later in uh, 1850 or 51, the Santa Cruz house was constructed. It started out as a log cabin, and then it was expanded into a, uh, a hotel, but the hotel was more in the, uh, in the kind that you would expect Daniel Boone to have uh, attended. Very low ceilings, an open hearth fireplace where the cooking was done, and so forth. This was on Front Street, where uh, the VFW Hall is. So Anthony was producing uh, plows in his, uh, um, in his foundry. And then the, uh, some people who had gone up to the gold country with potatoes from Santa Cruz discovered that um, they were actually getting more gold in exchange for the potatoes that they had than they were digging it out of the ground. And so when they came home, uh, bared down with the gold that everyone else had the trouble of digging up, it caused an agricultural, uh, a rush to the agricultural counties, Santa Cruz in particular, and the spud rush was on. Downtown Santa Cruz, which was not downtown at the time, the Hortaliza, erupted into a tent city. Uh, lots were being rented for $100 an acre to potato farmers. And uh, over overnight, Santa Cruz was growing into a, a, a little town. GM Jarvis built what he called the Custom House. Uh, it was just a store, actually. And across the street from that, because so many of the potato farmers were making a fortune, they built the first luxury hotel. This isn't that hotel, but the hotel that replaced it. It was um, called the San Lorenzo House and later was replaced with the Pacific Ocean House. However, in 1852, as the first harvest uh, yielded a great uh, boom, many people reinvested in the uh, reinvested in a second crop. And then the following year, 1853, they had a bumper crop, but they had saturated the market and you couldn't give potatoes away. So you could ride from Santa Cruz to Watsonville and discover potatoes dumped by the sides of the road or left to rot unharvested in the field. Many of the people who found themselves now stranded in Santa Cruz merely shingled over their tent frame cottages and overnight Santa Cruz had an instant downtown and an instant population. Elihu Anthony built his home on the bluff overlooking, uh, the, overlooking the clock tower site. F.A. Heen had uh, come to Santa Cruz in the 1850s and he invested in land and then discovered after the uh, bottom went out of the potato market that he had no one to sell it to. And what he really needed was to uh, start supplying the means to build uh, in Santa Cruz. And so he went into the lumber business and created a lumber yard in downtown Santa Cruz. He and Anthony established a water department, the first uh, water company in town. They also uh, invested in <clears throat> starting a stage road, which is now called Old San Jose Road. And that made Soquel the gateway to Santa Cruz. Soquel was also born in 1852 as a result of the uh, potato rush and uh, Watsonville in 1852. This is Watsonville Plaza in 1860. Well, I mean, this isn't in 1860 because it shows the uh, 1906 bandstand. But in 1860, uh, the owner of uh, Watsonville had been 
having a was being plagued with um, with squatters. Not all of the squatters were uh, Americans. They were they were equally divided between uh, Spanish and Americans. And when he finally was able to uh, prove that he had right to this land, a town of Watsonville was already on the property. But now they knew who to buy the property from. And so he gave Watsonville Plaza to the community as a gift in 1860. Now, here we see the uh, old mission to the, um, to the right of the screen here. Its facade had fallen off one, uh, about 1857, and so they built the wooden Catholic church to the uh, left of it. And it's in Gothic style, and here we see the old um, Golden Eagle Hotel is now being transformed into an orphan's uh, home, and behind it is the uh, Holy Cross School at uh, Emmett Street and Mission Street. And the downtown was getting its first um, brick building. Uh, here we see Front Street and um, Pacific Avenue, which was at the time called Main Street and Willow Street. And in the center was the Flatiron Building. And F. A. Heen built it because when the uh, county wanted to rent uh, Leslie's store, which was the first brick building in town, uh, he said that he wanted it for his grocery store and his residence above. And so Heen built the Flatiron Building in order to be the courthouse. So the courthouse moved down to the flats, and it also started to bring the town with it. Here we see a cross-cut saw, which is about uh, 15 or 20 feet long. We often don't think how, how much effort it took to cut down the, the redwoods, and they had to practically invent the, uh, the materials that they were going to do it with. So what were, the, what were they using all this lumber for? Well, wood frame structures mostly. And the wood frame uh, uh, construction divided into two categories. One was balloon frame and the other was western platform construction, which is what we use today. This differed from the um, post and beam construction that had predated it. And the uh, balloon frame, which was merely framing two stories at a time, was so called because uh, Easterners were afraid that if they built such a, such a building, it would just blow away in the wind. But this lightweight form of construction, or stick belt construction as it was called, was the, uh, the godsend of the boom towns of the West because it could be created quickly and, uh, and create pretty uh, spectacular uh, results. Here we see uh, a Greek vernacular structure. You can see that it is basically uh, a Greek temple refined to the nth degree so that you can barely tell it's there. But you see returns on the eaves, and that's one of the, uh, the clues to the Greek vernacular style. Then we have the Gothic architecture, and Gothic became a very popular um, revival because um, books started to come out studying it. it. It had not been considered the equal of neoclassical architecture until uh, books started to be written saying that actually the Gothic architecture is a, an expression of its structural form. Every element of the Gothic uh, is not a flight of fancy so much as it is an expression of the uh, structure of the architecture. You have brackets, you have uh, flying buttresses, um, braces, and so forth. So this is the Mark Hopkins uh, home in San Francisco. It is not the Gothic that the uh, uh, ancient Europe knew. It is a Victorianized Gothic. So uh, Gothic was a very um, uh, original expression in California. And then here's the more simple for, uh, version. It's called the uh, Carpenter Gothic. And you see the, uh, the centered um, gable there, which is a squeezed pediment. This is on Green Street, by the way. Inside, we can see that even the uh, furnace is designed like a Gothic uh, squeezed pediment house or cottage. 
And instead of the, um, the festoons rising up like, um, like spires on the gables of the uh, Carpenter Gothic house, they tended to fall uh, down towards the windows. And so, but here we have the more popular kind in uh, kind of gable work in uh, Santa Cruz, and that's the lace gable. This is the, uh, the home on um, uh, Judge Edgar Spalsbury House from the 1860s. It's on uh, uh, Laurel Street. And here, no, this is the one on Laurel Street. This is the Titus Hale House. He was the vice president of the Santa Cruz Railway Company. <coughs> and this is the Louis Schwartz House upon Mission Street with a very lacy uh, gable work. And then we have a, uh, a picture of the interior of a steamship. And the steamship Gothic was inspired, of course, by the steamships themselves, or the, the river boats. This almost looks like a river boat with the way the, uh, the porches uh, uh, surround the, um, the structure. This is the Four Palms apartment. Uh, it's across the street from uh, the Loudon Nelson Center. And then we get into the Italianate. In this case, we have corner coins. And it's all designed to uh, make the structure look like it is a, um, a masonry building. This was actually the old Methodist church from 1850 that was then um, repurposed after it was uh, decommissioned and turned into a home. And this is the uh, Rogers House in Watsonville, 1869. And we see the... Um, the gable is more of a complete Greek uh, style gable, but the difference is it has brackets uh, along the edges there. And this is the Dubinbos house in, or Dubinbis house in Soquel. And this is on Walnut Street with a squeezed pediment and more of a flattened roof, but inside that flattened roof, you'll see a, uh, or there would be a gable. And then we have the false front, which is an evolution uh, which was common in the, uh, the Old West. This is the uh, Silvar Beer Gardens at the corner of Silvar Street and High Street across from the Catholic Church. And then this is the Thomas Beck House, and it includes a tower so that you can see the Italianate element to the left, which might have been the original house, and then it was added on to. And when you add the tower to it, it becomes the Italianate villa. This is another Watsonville house. You can see uh, uh, bay windows on it. And the, the bay windows became very popular even as add-ons to older pieces of architecture because they would act as prisms and bring light into dark rooms. And this is the McFeeters house uh, where uh, uh, it's the beginning of the mansardic look. And essentially there is no real true mansard style. Mansard is basically Italianate with a mansard roof. And here's the uh, uh, Bayview in Aptos with its mansard roof. And then we get into the stick built style. At the 1876 Philadelphia World's Fair, they built the most elaborate example of this. And this was an absolute revelation. The stick built style was a completely different idea in architecture, in wooden architecture, and that was. Instead of mimicking other styles, why not let the, uh, the wooden architecture uh, be what it is? And so they created this in order to show how you can do it uh, with just expressing the beams that make up the, the uh, building and the brackets and the uh, spandrels and so forth. 
Here we see it in Aptos uh, in a much more uh, simplified way, but it, it, this is the uh, Alpine version of it. They would, um, uh, you can see the strap work around the windows, which tends to indicate the, uh, the, the stick built style. And then the exaggerated uh, brackets on the uh, uh, holding up the roof. But it was also called the Barbary Coast style because um, it was very common in the Barbary Coast area of San Francisco. Uh, this actually is one of several lighthouses that are, are done in this style. This is Point Furman. But it was also in uh, uh, Capitola in the, uh, the bathhouse that they had built there. You can see it in the gable work. And that was quite similar to the life-saving station on the, uh, the main beach in San Francisco. Now, an even more elaborate one is the Antlers, uh, the W.W. W. Brown uh, home. And he used his home as a sanitarium. And the uh, sanitarium boasted its gold cure. I don't know what that was, if they uh, gave you something to drink that had gold in it, or if they just uh, drained the gold from your pocket. <laughs> and this is a, a home on Ocean View Avenue, and now we see the, uh, the Villa Forum is now reasserting itself in other styles. So that this is a, uh, an Italianate villa with stick style overtones. And here's Alpine stick style in the uh, Emma, <coughs> Emma Wilson house on Ocean View Avenue. And even the um, Epworth by the Sea on Westcliff Drive. Uh, Epworth was actually built uh, or actually run by the Methodist minister or Methodist, Methodist Bishop of California who uh, had this as a summer home and used the entire block as the religious retreat for the Epworth League, which was the youth league of the church. And this is um, the McPherson house called Cherry Court. And it has some uh, interesting introduction of details. It looks stick, but it also has some turned posts. And once we get into the turned posts, then we're in the East Lake realm. Charles Locke Eastlake was a furniture designer in England, and so people were in America started to imitate his furniture styles on their homes. He was not too pleased with some of the results. He was trying to create a, a very pure medieval uh, arts and crafts style, and Americans tended more towards the elaborate. But uh, it's very beautiful. In this case, the house completely disappears to the porch. This is a pavilion that was built for the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. And it was used as a restaurant, an open air restaurant. And then here's some of the uh, uh, details. And the details were either incised and uh, uh, minimal, or they were botany panels. And botany panels are taken from the uh, Elizabethan half-timber cottages where sometimes they would ornament the infill between the, uh, the beams. And even the massing of the Elizabethan uh, uh, half-timber houses uh, started to influence American architecture. And the reason was Americans started to think uh, too, uh, too long we have been designing boxes and then trying to fit people into it. Why not design homes from the inside out so that it expands out in the form of wings and bays and so forth? And so the American style of Victorian architecture was nothing that was seen in, uh, in England. It is a unique style, and especially in the far west, where they didn't have architects to tell you what the true style is. They started to assemble uh, different pieces of gingerbread from different styles into one building, simply because that was what was available at the, uh, at the lumber yards. 
This is the Weeks Mansion on uh, uh, California Street in Santa Cruz. And this is the Weeks Mansion in the back and the uh, Santa Cruz High School in the foreground. And the high school has kind of an exotic uh, look with its uh, pepper pot dome. And across the street from it was uh, uh, this mansion. And then there were the Witch Hat Twins. These, were, these can still be seen there on uh, Walnut Street. But it shows that even humble cottages could have the, uh, uh, the look of, uh, of a major villa. And this is the Baycliffe model. It, it, it is repeated in varying forms uh, throughout Santa Cruz, but it always has a corner porch and a, uh, a bay window in the front and a front-facing uh, gable. And this is from the aesthetic school, which is how they would decorate their interiors. The aesthetic school uh, was very popular in uh, Seabright. <coughs> Seabright was a transcendentalist uh, religious retreat at one time. And they believed, part of the transcendentalist belief was that beauty is good for the soul. And so they, in, they tended to incorporate as best they could various motifs into their daily lives. And some of them were uh, oriental. We find in, the, uh, in this school of architecture that they are pulling from all different architectural styles and sometimes combining them in, un, in surprising ways. This is more examples of Bradbury and Bradbury arch, uh, wallpaper from uh, San Francisco, or Benicia actually. And then we get to the uh, oriental or uh, exotic look. This is more of a Moorish uh, form of gingerbread for an interior. And one of the most popular things was to have a Turkish corner, which was a couch in a, uh, a curtained area or alcove where lovers could neck. Now this started off as a very plain farmhouse and it was transformed into, uh, into this uh, Aladdin's castle or something. I mean, it really follows no known architectural <coughs> style except that it does have a few turrets here and there. But it is a, a tour de force and very original and it still exists. And this is another house on Ocean View Avenue. And now we're getting into the um, Queen Anne style. After so much geometrical look of the uh, East Lake style, people started to hunger for something a little more smoothly designed. And so they took pieces of Norman architecture and Norman farmhouses and Norman castles and combined them into a very American uh, uh, style. It includes some uh, detailing of uh, New England colonial style, but its most outstanding feature is the usually a round, uh, a round tower, drum tower, and a shingled portion. In this case, it's a shingled second story that uh, flares out at the lower end and that's called a Queen Anne shawl. Here's a more elaborate version. This is from uh, uh, Mission Street. It's the Dr. Fagan house. And here's a, a little cottage version. This is the uh, Dr. Lindsay house on Walnut Street. And this is um, Oh, I've forgotten. It's <coughs> Judge Julius Lee's house, and uh, it's in Watsonville. And this was the Cascade um, Laundry at the corner of Front and uh, Soquel Avenue. 
And finally, they tore down the old mission in 1885 and put up a uh, cathedral. The cathedral was red brick, which is not how we know it today. It's been painted white. Uh, but prior to that, the in it still has its beautiful interiors. They hired um, imported uh, Italian muralists to do these wonderful uh, uh, detailed murals, which have been recently restored after the earthquake. And also, they built a new school, uh, Holy Cross School. And the architect was um, um, Thomas Welsh from San Francisco. And so many of the parishioners were so impressed by his work that um, uh, Mr. McLaughlin wanted to hire him to build his house. And his house looks Queen Anne, but it's actually a shingle style or barn villa. And uh, that is intended to show that it's more barn dimensions than it is um, uh, the traditional cottage style. It has a very wide spreading uh, look to it in the barn style and an open uh, uh, tower cap, but lots of shingles on it. And this is the interior. Now, uh, Frank McLaughlin was a, uh, um, a former employee of Thomas Edison. In fact, he came west uh, to find tungsten for Edison's electric light experiments and then ended up staying in, uh, in California. He had a home in San Francisco on Knob Hill, and this was his summer home. And yet, when uh, Knob Hill burned in the uh, 1906 earthquake, we have some of the few surviving examples of Knob Hill interiors. Now, this is just the entry here. And then we can see the uh, gold room to one side and the entry uh, area to the other. This is the gold room, which was used as a ballroom at one time. And here we see the magnificent staircase going up to a stained glass window that was a picture of his daughter in one of her uh, costumes from the balls that they would hold there. She would make her grand entrance in front of this window uh, down the beautiful staircase. And this is the bedroom in the uh, tower. Well, all of this millwork was available in uh, local lumber yards. And in order to get the lumber out of the mountains, they, start, they built a flume because they couldn't get the ra railroad to settle in Santa Cruz. And so the flume came down from uh, Felton into Santa Cruz, or I mean from the mountains into Felton. The tourists uh, came to see the magnificent natural wonders. They wanted to see the redwoods. They wanted to see the natural bridges. But they weren't interested in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz was rather a, a junky town filled with utilitarian architecture that had been built as, during the Boomtown era as kind of throwaways by people who never intended to live here. So there was no thought in, uh, in town. And you can see some of the, the elements of that. It was a little uh, uh, worn at the edges. This is Pacific Avenue uh, from about uh, Soquel Avenue. So the first thing that F.A. Heen did was to try to uh, uh, reverse the situation by catering to a different class of tourism. He built a building to house one of the local um, business academies to make sure that it would stay here, the Chestnut Woods Business Academy. It was housed in this structure, which became the uh, tallest downtown uh, uh, building at the time, and so it was called the Alta Building. Chestnut Woods Business Academy was a, an academy that did not hold regular classes. Instead, you could enter or leave a course at any time during the year. It was all based on how far you were going through with a certain program. And that became uh, perfect, especially in a tourist area where you would have a, a, a constant overturn of, uh, of people. 
and this is another one of the classes. And they accepted a lot of women into the program, so it was a, one of the early uh, places where women could get an education. Heen also built the uh, Heen Corner to the south, which is at the corner of Lincoln and Pacific Avenue on the left there. And uh, here he housed his uh, medical establishment. On the bottom floor, we see the uh, curio shop. And this was where Buckhart's candies got started. They were a soda fountain, and there were a lot of soda fountains in this area of town, which started to become known as College Corners because of the number of um, colleges and seminaries uh, that were in this area and other schools. Uh, they would include such things as the, uh, uh, the Typing School, the Del Sart Dancing Academy, the Young Ladies Seminary, and so forth. Now, the waterfront was not much to look at. It was a beautiful setting, but all of the bathhouses that sprung up in the 1860s were rather barn-like structures. So that was another thing they wanted to change. They took the old Douglas house, which was a, uh, the one hotel that uh, had, any, uh, uh, had any value to it on the coast, and they upgraded it into um, Queen Anne style, and then added a beautiful Queen Anne wing to it, and enlarged it even more. The, uh, this became the Sea Beach Hotel in the 1890s, and it had a marvelous Pelargonium uh, garden, which had at least 50 varieties of uh, unique Pelargoniums that were named after various people in Santa Cruz when the seeds were sold. And this is the views of the, uh, the wharves in the front. And it had a very long dining room inside as well as a separate building in back that housed the art gallery. Some of the art gallery later went to uh, the de Young Museum collection. And this is when uh, President Benjamin Harrison visited Santa Cruz in 1891. Uh, He's the one with the white top hat, which was his trademark. Well, other communities started to build these magnificent uh, uh, hotels, such as Capitola, which was just a camp at the time. And uh, we see the beautiful Hotel Capitola here. And uh, it was a, a spot that many people enjoyed up until it burned down in 1929. And even up in the Redwoods, this is the Hotel Roerdenen. Roerdenen is a Scottish word meaning enchanted forest. It was a log-constructed uh, structure, so unlike some of the others that tended towards elegance, this tended towards the grand log tradition. And then there was another uh, element called a rus en urbe. I don't know what the origin of the word was. I just found it in old Santa Cruz articles. It essentially showed how uh, some places were creating little pockets of nature in a highly, uh, in a densely populated urban area. So one of the earliest mountain resorts uh, in the Santa Cruz area was the Pope House on uh, Mission Street. And you don't often think of going to Mission Street to, uh, to visit the Redwoods, but it had its own forested grove and the whole uh, Mission Terraces area became popular for that very reason. This, however, is uh, Phelan Park on Lighthouse Point, and it was where um, James Duvall Phelan and his family lived. And this shows also uh, another part of Phelan Park, and it includes one of the statues by his friend Douglas Tilden, who was the nephew of the lighthouse keeper. And then this is the... Um, uh, Lincoln Court, and it was 
it was set up by um, Morris Abrams as a uh, retreat for a lot of the churches in the area. And so there were a number of religious uh, encampments along the coast. We have the Twin Lakes uh, Church, uh, which was the Baptist retreat. There was um, Santa Maria del Mar, which was the Catholic retreat down the coast. And up the coast in the Circles area was the um, Garfield Park Christian Campgrounds, or Disciples of Christ. And this is a enormous uh, a church that sat in the middle of their campgrounds, uh, had a 70-foot steeple that could be seen for miles around. Well, this is um, Fred Swanton, and Swanton was a young man in this picture, but he, uh, when he came to town, he and his dad built the Swanton house where the post office is today. He also established about 1884, one of the first phone companies in town. And then later he uh, helped establish the first electric company. When he tried to electrify Santa Cruz, he built his own uh, lamp posts, which are basically out of uh, uh, water pipe parts. But he created this uh, cruciform design and boy, was everyone impressed when he lit up the town. His next step in 1891 was to build, uh, was to electrify the Pacific Avenue trolley. However, he discovered the, the city council didn't want him to do that because they didn't trust <coughs> electricity. However, they would let him electrify the unfinished trolley if he finished the uh, Mission Street trolley, taking it down Young Love uh, out to the end of Woodrow. So he did, and he built the trolley park of View de Lo out there, which was uh, famous for its little cliff house. Then in 1894, a terrible fire swept through town. It uh, consumed most of the tri corner block of Pacific Avenue, and then jumped Cooper Street to gut the courthouse. So the devastation was rather most of the downtown because most of the town downtown relied on that central block. The first to rebuild was Hoteling, who had just lost a one-year-old Hoteling Hotel. He rebuilt it and named it the St. George Hotel because St. George fought the fire-breathing dragon and won. <laughs> 